Thank you, Kushlani, for introducing me. OK, so without further ado, we'll go into what's rise of streaming SQL is. So you might have heard on the uh, keynotes and on many places, we talk about three things. If you want to build an integrated enterprise, you need APIs, you need events and streams. Because APIs is one way that we, we do request and response. So some system asks something and you give a response. But you can't always build systems like that. You sometimes have to have a streaming system, like there will be data coming out. The system will be pumping out a lot of data. So you should manage that, process through that data, and to get, to get some decisions. So those are like asynchronous systems that you build through that. So there are request response based system, and there are more of like notification or more, more data oriented integration. So this, is, this we call as data integration. So stream processing is something that comes into that particular space other than the request response, the other part of it, doing asynchronous and continuous data processing. So when it comes to data, what is streaming data? So streaming data is a system that produces data continuously. It can be an XML message that is crea created, or it can be some key value pairs that is created. It can be some records. It can be any JSON element. It can be anything. But as there are lots and lots of these types of data is created and continuously pushed, so we have to build systems that we can manage or monitor and do act on those data. So that's all that we do with stream processing. And why stream processing is important, we, we have all heard about batch processing, right? So with Hadoop and everything, so we tr traditionally, when it comes to analytics, we do batch processing because that's much easier. We collect all the data, and then we write something to analyze that. But all data is streaming at its core because every data is generated one by one. Right? It's not generated as a batch. So if we can process the data as its source, as and when the data comes out, we can be much more intelligent or much more reactive to the environment. So the, if your system needs to be more agile, then the system should be able to read the data on its core. So for example, even if it is log analytics or transaction data, sensor data, traffic data, anything that you say to kick, all of those are produced one at a time. So we should be able to process them on, as and when the data is available. So that's all we do with streaming, stream processing. So we have so much of data, like it can come from many systems, devices, drivers, whatever that you call. And what we basically do is we try to process them in real time, as in when the data appears immediately, and then we try to understand if there's anything interesting happening there, or we can present that in some sort of a dashboard. We can call services based on that in a reactive way, and we can even do some pre-processing and update the databases, so you can do, use that for various other purposes. So it's all being agile and making, doing processing as much as possible. So when it comes to some of the stream processing operations, so it is, it, the stream processing is an event-driven architecture. Like all the, the event is basically, in this case, it's data. So the data is pushed through the system. And as and when the data is pushed, they tend to modify or they get to get massaged or throughout the way. And you can also do stream, streaming data integration through this. So that is also one of the key elements of that. And then, when it comes to the key functionalities, if you want to do data pre-processing, we can do that. If you want to integrate the data on real time with historical data to get more information, that is one part of it. Or now service integrations are also coming in. So as and when the data comes into the system, you want to call a service, you get more information about that, and continue. So those kind of things can also be done. And most importantly, streaming summarization. Right. So when you have lots of applications, Sometimes it's not feasible to send all the data to the centralized system to do processing. So we might need to do some summarization. It may be just filtering out them, or it may be like getting averages, maximum, minimum, or getting some sort of statistic about the data before we publish to further systems. So we will be able to manage the scale of the system. So, so those kind of streaming summarizations can be done. And KPIs, alerts, of course. And then event correlation. So when, it come, when you take traditional complex event processing world. So we had uh, 
event correlations, like correlating two or more events over time, and identifying complex patterns, like an event happened, an event did not happen, and then an event happened, I want to identify this particular pattern, or things like that, or trends like continuously increasing or triple bottom. These kind of things can be identified. And also, going further, real-time predictions and also learning, like streaming machine learning, like online machine learning, as in when the data come in, we learn the data and we try to predict. So those kind of things are some, some, some things that you can do with the current stream processing world. So I'll, the details of these will be discussed by the next two speakers. I'll go into the details of how the stream processing evolved over time and what are the challenges that we face on when we're trying to do stream processing and how you can get over it. So when we look at the market, so it's, the market is about 300 to 500 million uh, million size, and it's also growing at 30% rate. So the agile way of doing like data integration and how things happy, uh, happen in real time is, 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 is quite big. And when it comes to the positive side of the market, now you can see the analytics is moving from batch to real time. So all of all the big data vendors are now adding more and more real-time capabilities to their batch analytics because batch itself is not enough for the current market. And uh, more than that, now the machine learning is also moving from the batch-oriented world to more and more streaming machine learning to get results on real-time and to, and, and to process those stuff. So apart from that, we have microservices, and we have observability of that. So microservice observability means that when you have thousands of services, without having a governance, you can't understand what's happening. So if you want to have governance, then you have to somehow get a lot of information about all of those services. So how are you going to get all of those information? You could be flooded with so many API calls, and if you want to process so many API calls, it will be a mess. So Efficient stream processing is a way of how you can monitor, how you can observe all the system, and take interesting decisions on when to scale, how to scale, or which service is the bottleneck of your system. Uh, all, of those in, all of those interconnected items can be identified and managed through the stream processing environment. And like microservices, IoT. So it's services being small and everywhere is microservice, and same way that its devices is also on, now all over the places. So if devices are going to publish data to your system, the system is going to get overloaded. So how you can efficiently do that, process it, and get meaningful data output, data out of that, is a key part of stream processing. And security analysis, analytics, it's also a key element of that. And now we can also do, rather than just messaging, uh, um, organizations are doing real-time ETLs, like rather than waiting for a file and extract the file and transform and load, now we don't need to wait for the whole file to be generated. As and when the data come in, we put it to Kafka or wherever, and we process as and when we do ETLs, as and when the data come in. So it's very, uh, it's very attractive in that way. Uh, and there are some negatives as well. So why stream processing is getting a little delayed to get the market attraction when it comes to uh, batch kind of SQL-ish world, uh, why streaming processing is not that used is because lacks of provisioning. Like, for example, the developers find it very difficult to uh, program a stream processing environment because it's very dynamic. You have to, because when the data is gone, it's gone, right? You can't re retry, retry that. Right? So it's all in real time. So that kind of environment and the existing tools did not have enough capability to achieve that. And uh, so th with the stream processing, this problem is stream with the stream processing, with streaming SQL, this problem is becoming much simpler to handle. So I'll, I'll go into the details later. And it's also the success of streaming SQL and uh, stream processing also depends on the market for integration and analytics. So as and when they grow, this will also grow. So it's, it's, it's not a negative, though, but it's a dependency on those two markets. So how you can build a streaming app? So we want to process data as and when it comes in. So either you can go and code by yourself. You can create your own Java app or Go or whatever. You write an app that connects to somewhere. It pro gets all the events. You process that and push it out. So that's very simple. But 
the problem is you need to write a lot of glue code. Right? So rather than the core business logic, you have to write lots of lots of code to get it done. So it's not efficient. So there are stream processors that is already existing in the market which give you some sort of a template. So you have to write the actors within that and you can just deploy that. So if you take Apache Storm, that is one of the system which gives you the infrastructure to run stream processing, but you have to write code to the business logic. So it reduces the glue code part, but you have to still write code, compile that, and manage that through that. Right? So, and it is quite difficult if you want to do uh, a time-based aggregation, or windowing, or joins, complex joins. So in those cases, you have to find your own logic of how, do, how you can achieve that. So if you are a really good coder, you can do it, but it's, it's a little bit of a stretch. Uh, and it's quite hard to maintain and change because we have to still code and maintain through that. And when you look at some of the previous systems, they also give very nice graphical tools. So you can drag and drop and build your system through that. All business users like that, but there is an advantage of that and a disadvantage. The disadvantage is you can't change that much faster because like, if you are an advanced user, you can copy paste some part of it, you can edit through that. It is much easier that way, you can template it, but all of those features are not there. Like, you, can, you can do very primitive stuff, but when it comes to more and more complex uh, integration, that whole diagram will get very complex and there will be no abstraction, so it will be a problem. So, it's very inefficient for an advanced user, but for a beginner, it's a good way. And then we have the streaming SQL, which is good for advanced user because what you do is we always type in and um, get the like more, mostly like writing SQL and SQL scripts. Uh, it is easier to understand, but it it has a disadvantage as well. You can't visualize that. You write a lot of scripts. You don't know which script is connecting to which one, how it is connecting. So when you have lots and lots of those, sometimes you get confused. So, so streaming SQL has a disadvantage, whereas the graphical tool is the disadvantage of streaming SQL is an advantage of graphical tools and vice versa, right? So how it evolved. So when we look at the history, originally we had databases, and when we want to get some information about it, we just go and query them. Right? So if you want continuously, like if you, in, in sometimes when you build dashboards, what you do is we put a polling stuff. So every five seconds it polls the database and update the dashboard. So that's one way of doing it. So that's what we traditionally did. And sometimes we still do that. And then uh, systems, what they basically improve that as active databases. So what that basically do is it's kind of database triggers. So when some condition is met, the database will trigger you. So you can take some decisions about that. So that's the second version of how we improved to become streaming. And then there is Telegraph CQ, uh, which is based on uh, uh, post PostgreSQL. So what they basically did was they brought this concept out and they made a uh, long-term running system. So you can write a query that will be always matching with all the data that is coming in. Right? Like, so you don't need to query every time. You can deploy the query. So as and when the data come in, they, they do matching on real time. And this kind of system is then divided into two sections. One thing is called the traditional complex event processing, and the other one is called the stream processing. So when you say complex event processing, it was about detecting complex patterns. So there was a need to identify very complex patterns like trends or, or, or non-occurrence of event or, or fraud. All of those things happen, like if you want to say a particular sequence of events. Um, so for example, I, I took a book from the bookstore. I didn't pay. I went out. So that is a pattern that I want to identify. So that is a complex pattern that we have to use. Or else, if it is a um, card, credit card transaction, a simple use case would be, OK, I stole uh, someone's credit card. OK, first I want to check whether that card works. So I do some minor transaction. And then I go and do a huge transaction within a period of time. So if there is a particular pattern like that, then I want it to be alerted. Or there is two transactions happening on two geographical locations, which is apart from, uh, uh, which is apart 
which a human can't travel even in a plane, then at that point we have to uh, make that as a fault, faulty transaction. So likewise, there can be various patterns. Some of them can be very simple. Some of them can be very, very complex. So all of those can be detected through the system called complex event processor. And there are some examples which is like Esper, the Siddhi that we use as the Ku, it is also a complex event processing engine. Uh, and you have Apama, IBM Infosphere. So those are some of other uh, systems that provide these complex event processing capabilities. But one of the key thing is that complex event processors are not meant to be scalable because they have a lot, a lot of state because you have to remember a lot of information in the, uh, the past information to take the decision. Like if you want to identify event pattern, that event pattern can be over a day, over an hour, over whatever thing, right? So you have to remember those information and process it. Sometimes when those kind of systems are like that, it is not easy to scale. So traditional complex event processors cannot scale like to more than two nodes, right? So because of, uh, uh, because of various uh, state-related issues. And then we have stream processing, which has a scalable data processing environment. Here they do like simple filtering kind of stuff. Okay, I do simple filtering, counting, that kind of very simple case, simple data pre-processing, but it can scale very, very well. So that's how the two markets uh, have evolved. And you can see the complex event processing and stream processing were originally used in very niche markets, like uh, stock markets, monitoring and alerting, surveillance cases. So all of them are more and more hardware bound and millisecond accuracy, that kind of a particular market that it was in. And then the streaming SQL, like the streams, were moved into the big data space. Okay, like now with the Yahoo's S4 and Twitter Storm, people started using the streaming in big data world because we have a lot of data and we need to process as and when the data come in. So they, it, this was advertised as like Hadoop, but in real time, right? So the Hadoop was getting traction, so they marketed the stream processing as, okay, we, like, we are like Hadoop, but we do you know, everything in real time. So that's the initial understanding of this. And Spark Streaming, Samsa, Flink are some of the byproduct of this particular uh, world. And now big data itself from the traditional Java-based MapReduce, it moved into SQL, and similar to that, the stream processing and the CEP, which is originally the complex event processing world, which had some sort of SQL, though both merged, and now the streaming SQL has both the capabilities. So, so some of the streaming SQL systems have real-time capabilities as well as um, um, simple filtering kind of capabilities, scalability, and also uh, SQL-ish to write more complex logic in a scalable way. So all of those are in one place. And these are some systems that provide streaming SQL in the current market. So WSO2SP is also one of that. And there are many other systems. Everyone has their advantages and disadvantages. So you can uh, uh, investigate that in a while. So when it comes to streaming SQL, as I told you, SQL is we query the data and we get a response. It is a synchronous process, right? So it is a table where we have a static data and we do queries. When it comes to streaming SQL, it's the upside down of the table where you have the static query and we run the data on top of that, right? So it's almost ups and up and down. Uh, and we also have asynchronous processing on the streaming SQL side. Uh, but not on the uh, SQL-ish world. So for example, if you take Siddhi SQL, which is one of the streaming SQL, we can define a stream, we can process that, and basically we can also identify, do some filtering, we can correlate with the table, all of those is possible. We can connect to external uh, sources to get ma messages in. So the details of this will be covered by a different talk, so I just want to give you an example of how streaming SQL will look like. And of course, like every system, there are challenges. So as I told you, uh, the streaming SQL does not have an easy visualization, and that's, uh, that's a problem. And at the same time, when it comes to stream processing, it also have, have its own problem. Like when you have complex event processing logics in that, it's very hard to scale. And it needs, and the traditional stream processing needs a lot, about six 
two, eight nodes to run. So even if you want to do a small stuff, you have to have eight nodes deployment. Some DevOps don't like that, right? So that's the problem that we have to solve. And uh, it does not support online machine learning. Like as, a, as going forward, people are requesting for online machine learning, and it is becoming a hot topic, and it's not, not there yet. Uh, and moreover, we can't do long-term aggregations with the streaming, stream processing. Like as I told you, if you want, everything is kept in memory. So if I want to have one-year-old data and process that, it's not possible. So those are some challenges that we have in the streaming SQL world. So we have WSO to stream processor, which is somewhat I have explained to you, which can collect data from multiple sources, which can transform that data, do complex event processing, do machine learning related activities, anomaly detection, do incremental aggregations and stuff, and push the output uh, to various other sources. So how does WSO to stream processor solve some of these problems? So what we did was, OK, streaming SQL is great. So we had the streaming SQL originally. And then we built a drag and drop editor, which can, you can build the SQL itself. So as in when you drag and drop, you can have queries and streams that is connecting to it. So it is not a some, something new. It is the SQL, but now you can graphically build the SQL and visualize that, So, which, which made that streaming SQL is not readable problem to go away. So if you are an expert user, you can code, uh, type it or query it, or else you can also drag and drop and build the SQL by yourself. And we also have a two node HA, right? We don't need a five plus node deployment to run. If you have a smaller use case, which is up, and we can process up to 100K events per second if you are not doing database transactions, because databases have their own upper limit. But if we can do uh, up to 100K on non-database transaction scenarios with just two nodes, having an active and passive, which is quite powerful uh, to start small and then grow. So this can also scale. So if you want a scalable deployment, even if you have thousands of events coming to your system, we also have a cleaner Kafka-based deployment. So there will be a, a, I think Mohan will be covering that on uh, how we can basically scale this beyond two nodes in a much efficient way. And we have incremental uh, state persistence. Like, for example, if the system goes down, we can easily recover from the system because we do incremental states. So there are details on that. Uh, and when it comes to uh, machine learning, we have two types of machine learning. One thing is we serve pre-built machine learning models. So if you have, if you're using Spark or if you're using Python, R, or whatever, you can build some machine learning model. And if you have already built those machine learning model, you can import that to stream processor so that on real time you can do predictions. So that is uh, a useful scenario. But at the same time, uh, we also some support some native machine learning models, like if Spark and uh, TensorFlow Java models, we can directly import them and use them. But at the same time, we are also investing a lot on real-time learning. So we learn as and when the data come in, and then we predict when we get to a level that you know that prediction is stable, right? So when you have, when we have 80% uh, confidence or 60% confidence, then we start. You can configure that, and upon that point the system will automatically try to push you predictions. So this one is like you don't need to build a pre-built pre, pre, uh, pre model and learn through that. The system will try to learn by itself. And if it finds out it's good enough, it starts giving you predictions. So it's, it's the online machine learning. We have regression analysis on that. We have Marco models, uh, anomaly detections, k-means, lots of stuff that we basically do through this. And apart from that, we have, uh, we have built in Lambda architecture, which was talked about so, so many times with a lot of vendors. What they basically say is, OK, I have Lambda architecture. Lambda architecture is a good way to get the real-time data and the batch data. And on the fly, you join those two and give the current information. So you get historical data from the batch, you get current values from real time, and then you combine both to give a correct results as a, to the millisecond. But that is very, very difficult for a customer to implement. So what we have done is we have baked that into the system. So we use databases for batch process data, 
which we do. And then we also have a streaming real-time component on top of it. So when you request the data, for like if you ask for yearly average, you give year average, and the current year average will be correct to the milliseconds. So that is very, very important. So with this kind of analytics can be done through the WSO2 stream processor, which is not there in any other um, vendors. So if even to do this, we really don't need any big data storage. We can just do with an RDBMS of MySQL or Oracle or any of those things, because we are only storing summarizations. So we, when you are doing summarizations, we store the summarizations in, 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 in second summarization, minute summarization, hour summarization, day summarization, and years. And then we have an, in, uh, an intelligent way of combining them and presenting it to the correct results. Apart from that, uh, so this is the last slide. So what you can achieve through WSO2 stream processor, you can just start with two nodes, and then you can scale as and when you want and detect complex event patterns over time, which is not quite there on other stream processing systems, because even though there's a merge from CEP to uh, CEP and uh, streaming world, some stream processors has, but some stream processors don't. Like, for example, Flink has some features, but SAMSA doesn't have it. So likewise, uh, some features, some products have uh, complex event processing in them. And real-time machine learning models uh, running them and fuse the data in motion and the data in rest. So that is one of the key features that we have. And perform aggregation from seconds to years. So this is what I'm saying. Like, we can process up to year long or even more aggregations when it comes to aggregation. It's not just storing everything and retrieving them. But if you have a predefined aggregation, then we can do for a longer period with less storage. So that is an interesting thing that we can do with this. And we also let users to tweak the queries on real time without uh, waiting for a change request. And you can be much more agile through that. Uh, the, my following talks to, will cover that. And real time ETLs. And if you also want to do a request response based rules, this can also, be, this can also do that. So we can also synchronously do request response from that. So this is a very high level abstraction of what we can do with stream processing and what is the advantages of doing a streaming SQL. So the following talks will go into the details of some of the use cases of streaming SQL and then how you can actually build on it. So feel, please come to the tutorial session so you can see on live how you can code in our uh, editor uh, and, and, and go, for, go forward and implement a fully scalable stream processing in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a very easy way. Yeah, thank you.